All right. So uh, let's start with the presentation. Um, right. The topic is pixel art, uh, practical stuff uh, by Felix Klein. Ah! <laughs> two more just... types. <laughs> two more types, and it's no, oh, wait. Someone just actually, joined. actually, no. Oh yeah, it's just a joint. <laughs> What is wrong I with think, that? I, I pay, pay attention. It's all right. All right. I tell okay. you when someone. Okay. When someone does it. That oh. is probably is just Hannah is doing it, in a, and yeah. then we dropped the soundboard because of Hannah. <clears throat> so. Um, before you start, Neo Wang, what fundamentals should we keep in mind in Pixel? I tried learning, but I can't seem to be remotely decent at it. Uh, Felix is probably talking a bit about this while he doing um, while he's doing the presentation. <clears throat> Yeah, I'm. I'm not really. I cannot really uh, cover all the all the fundamentals. Yes! I'm just gonna. Oh, God damn it! This is not what. What the heck is that? Anyway, I I cannot really promise that I can really. I can't cover all the fundamentals of pixel art. I'm just gonna give you some rough ideas on certain topics, in particular about colors and shading, because those are actually really important for pixel art in the end. And um, just to give you a rough idea, um, how you can create basic stuff uh, with those techniques and uh, it's actually a lot of stuff that I learned over the years so a lot of stuff I'm talking about I didn't understand at the beginning when I was doing pixel art and I thought well would I, if I would have known that earlier things would have been simple so that's why I'm gonna tell you right now so maybe it's easier for you to get into pixel art that's the whole idea okay let's start right pixel art practical stuff next slide um, what is pixel art, which is probably the most uh, pointless part of this presentation, I'm just going to quickly go over. So please remember, pixel art is essentially <coughs> um, simulating like uh, the art style of uh, from old times when we had 8-bit or 16-bit or maybe 32-bit uh, machines, which had like a lot of technical limitations. That means mostly low resolution, so you didn't have full HD or even uh, close to that, so you had like... Uh, Small graphics, um, we're talking about 8x8 pixel tiles or sprites of maybe up to 64 times 64 pixels. I mean, usually you had more like 16 times 16 or 32 times 32. So that was the resolutions we were talking about for a character or for small details. And of course, a few colors. So up to four colors is actually what you had on the Game Boy and the NES, as far as I understood. In fact, uh, if you wanted to create more colors with the NES, you had to combine several sprites. That's at least what I understand, understood. Uh, for the Super Nintendo, I think there are 16 colors. Uh, no guarantee that those numbers are actually correct, but that's uh, at least roughly like the kind of uh, limitations you had back at the time. So we are trying to create graphics which are kind of similar to that. So obviously, the, ver the basic stuff is to just keep the resolution low and don't use too many colors and <coughs> then you can call it pixel art. God damn it, I'm probably, maybe I'm gonna shut down the soundboard after all because it's just, uh, it's just not dealing with all those people in the stream chat, I think. Um, <laughs> oh yeah, okay, the stream seems to be dead. Let, let's just continue. Oh, hi so, Mark. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, but Sunshine. Maybe you're uh, gonna take her bed while after the presentation is over. It's actually not something you should run doing a presentation anyway. So. Mhm. Mm so let me just find the right window. This one. Okay. Soundboard is now disabled. <clears throat> Alright. So that's uh, for about, about the introduction. So that is what pixel art is more or less about. I mean, the thing is, yes, we should stay close to these technical limitations, but we don't have to force ourselves to exactly um, be uh, like uh, fulfill these conditions, like having at most 16 colors. We don't have to do that. We just have to create graphics that kind of look like this. So it's, I think it's important to also understand that um, actually making sure that you just have this very fixed palette or these uh, a very a certain amount of colors doesn't really, it uh, actually makes it harder to create the graphics, but people won't notice that, I think. So if you have a sprite that has 20 colors, it will probably look like pixel art just as well as a sprite that has the proper amount of 16 colors, because simply like people cannot, don't really go ahead and count the colors. And sometimes it's, it's just about having enough contrast between the colors and things like that. Um, so anyway, let's talk about shading. So shading is like uh, the thing 
how you decide the colors of the surface of something. And when we talk about shading, what you very often see is like the, the canonical sphere, essentially like just some sphere. And then you have like these colors, like uh, you have, um, usually the light is coming from one direction. And this image that would be in the upper left corner, so essentially the light is shining down. You have shadow in the lower right part of the sphere. And then there's some <coughs> specular reflection, I think it's called, which is kind of like this dot here. Like it's essentially just the light reflecting directly to your eye. Um, there you have a, like a very highlight, like essentially a very bright spot on the surface. That's usually uh, what you see when you talk about shading. But the thing is, using a sphere is not that practical because it turns out most of the shapes you're actually using when you do pixel art for a lot of for stuff like furniture or like machines is actually, it's not, it's not a sphere. Usually it's actually a box. So what I'm going to talk about today is like how you actually do shading of a box. And we are just looking at two boxes. This here is actually a box. It's essentially aligned to the screen and then we have like this isometric box as an alternative and here we just see the outlines and next we will uh, add several steps to um, include the shading. The first step is essentially just adding flat colors and when it comes to flat colors um, it's important I think especially when you have like games which are top-down like with some kind of perspective it's important that you have a very strong contrast between the upper area and the front. So like uh, the floor of the shape, like the upper area, um, if it's, if they, it should be much brighter or much darker than the front because that way the player can actually understand the shape much easier. If it's like roughly the same color, the, ch the player might have uh, problems actually understanding the shape and then you have problems with depth perception. And especially if you do top-down games, like CrossCode for instance, it's important to like uh, choose the colors right because uh, people are supposed to understand three-dimensional shapes but they only have two-dimensional information. There's no, there's no shortening among the depth and things like this. So and that, that's why colors are really important to kind of like support the perception of the three-dimensional shape. Um, so that's like the basic thing, just flat colors. Make sure that the, the upper area and the front have very st uh, strong contrast. Next um, is actually um, what we do with the outlines. The thing is you can just take black outlines and fill them with color. That's one style. But what I think is actually make things look more pleasant and is also like uh, even helping further to uh, support the three-dimensional shape is to color the outlines in certain ways. Here, for instance, we have like the front edge of the box colored white. Essentially, this is like the specular um, reflection, which is essentially just yeah the edge. So we just assume that the light on the edge reflects directly at your eye, and I think that's actually also often the case uh, in reality because there's a lot of uh, curvature, you could say. So it's kind of like it's very likely that you have the right vector, so the light reflects back to your eye. So kind of it's it's sort of intuitive to make edges white like this, so people would understand, ah, oh, there seems to be an edge here. It's actually more likely to understand that this is the front edge than just having a black outline like here. And what you can also do is essentially using different colors, colored outlines to kind of emphasize where the light is coming from. For instance, here we have a more light blue outline. Um, while on the right, we have a black outline, which kind of emphasizes that the light is coming from the left. So you can use outlines to kind of emphasize the shading and the three-dimensional shape. And uh, just taking these two ideas, so like having very strong contrast for the upper and the front um, surface, as well as these um, very strong colors for the outlines to emphasize the, the shading, just using those two techniques, you can already shade a lot of different things very effectively. For instance, this piece of cheese here, kind of like it's just, yeah, the front is much brighter than uh, the bottom and you have a very bright outline here, kind of emphasizing that this is the edge. And if you look here for like uh, the holes of the cheese, I just decided to use a darker color because it's kind of like hidden from the light. So intuitively it would be slightly darker. But then what it did, actually this picture doesn't make sense, but uh, just ignore this one. 
Um, but when I what I did is just add some brighter colors at the bottom, which essentially is, if you think about it, at the bottom of the hole because it goes inside. There's a surface which is um, like um, essentially a ground surface, and the ground surface, just like the upper surface here, is always brighter than a wall surface in this context, and that's why this one is brighter. And just using this actually kind of again emphasizes the shapes, and you're, it's easier for you for for the player to understand the shape that way. And yeah, we use this technique, for instance, for leaves. It very often looks nice to just also use um, bright pixels for the font shape here, or maybe for this uh, fence here. Just some light colors here at the bottom at the side. Uh, what you also notice here, it's it's not always 100% consistent. Like for instance, here I say. Yeah, like um, it's it's not symmetric. So here you actually have more. You have have a dark outline here, but on the left side you have a bright outline. While here I just say I don't care. Here it's actually bright, and here it's also bright. The thing is, um, these kind of rules that kind of help the perception, but you don't have to force yourself to be hundred percent consistent because in the end people will most likely not notice. So you can cheat like this. It's actually fine. But still, using at least uh, to some extent uh, these kind of techniques helps the perception overall. Um, right, so that's now we come to uh, the next part, but are, are there any questions so far? So if you have any questions about this content or any comments, please write in the chat to use at Radical Fish Games. Um, the last thing I see is that the stream is dead. I hope that's not the case for everybody. Um, Otherwise, uh, yeah, that would be kind of a waste. But uh, actually, what I plan to do is upload this whole workshop uh, to YouTube at the end. So you can still watch it on YouTube, hopefully, with a good quality. Um, yeah, so that in that case, uh, you can still watch it. Anyway, uh, since there are no questions here so far, um, maybe rehost the stream. I, 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 don't want it, I don't want to do this right now because that would essentially interrupt the whole stream, and that's kind of always a mess because you cannot connect this. And it would only be for one person, when everyone else would. Yeah, since like there also seems to be only one person complaining so far. At least so far. I mean, other, other, other like... Okay, let's I just continue. I wanted it may, might be <laughs> because of our location in Germany, so maybe we should look into this. I already got the best point. internet connection possible in this area. No, no, I mean the location you this twitch has mm. for you because you are in germany blah blah, blah. yeah it i think i selected the server in frankfurt but i can check it again sometime anyway right let's continue um an outline free process so what i want to describe in this next step is essentially um how we can create a shape without using outlines at all essentially i'm just gonna uh, just going to create some piece of furniture, actually one you find in, in Bakikum, it's kind of like a small shelf, actually it wasn't created by me, it was actually created by Freeze, but I just took it and uh, like um, did like I created it, like, but even though I didn't, anyway. So first you just create uh, with basic color shapes, no outlines whatsoever, it's important to use different colors for like the top surface and the front surface. Here. Um, like you see this kind of beige color for the front uh, going over to a brown which essentially show, shows this is like uh, again the top surface this is the front surface and then it actually changes some kind of yellow color which means that like it's still um, the front surface just a different uh, kind of material um, the next step is then to add some basic outlines essentially you use some white outlines here at the bottom uh, again to emphasize the highlight and some dark outlines at the top uh, and also here in between, actually here you have like some kind of separation and on the left side, because here this area ends, so essentially this is a right outline, it's dark and here the left surface st uh, starts, uh, the right side, the right part of the shelf starts, so this is essentially a left outline, so this one is bright, and that's how you choose the two colors, it's kind of consistent and then you kind of see, okay here this shape ends and here the other shape starts. Um, so yeah, just adding some basic outlines. Also here, essentially a bright outline again because the right light is coming from the left. It's a left outline. Here again, a dark outline. And also adding some d outlines down here to kind of like emphasize this shadow. So the light is coming from above. We just assume that this beige shape here, this gray gray shape, is kind of like a bit um, like going in front of the lower shape. So there's a bit of shadow below it that kind of emphasizes this and uh, so you just make some 
a few dark colors down here. And yeah, that's essentially that's essentially it. Um, the next step would be to add more lines like this and just add more details. It's always a good idea with whatever you do to just start with the basic shape and adding more details as you go along because that way you get like uh, a first good impression if the thing looks actually decent and then when you work out details uh, usually things won't break. It's just will, will look better overall and there's no risk that you need to redo things if you already put a lot of work in it so always it's a good thing to start rough and then just add details later on. So here we essentially just add more lines to give it a, a bit more detail. We, add, we just add some bright line up here to kind of emphasize there's another small surface on top of the other surface here. And here we actually added a few holes, uh, added some outlines um, just to give it uh, like a bit of detail. Um, and finally we just add some texture and that is actually a process where at least I think what happens, what works really well usually is um, kind of using some sort of dithering, kind of like aligning pixels in, uh, how do you say, <laughs> I'm actually I'm limit of my English here right now, uh, checkboard pattern, like from, isn't that called like this? Checkboard Check pattern? Checkerboard pattern, yeah. Essentially just, uh, yeah, like just um, having them uh, sorted in a kind of diagonal way. Uh, and using these kind of uh, diagonal patterns, it usually looks pretty nice because it's a contrast to the otherwise horizontal and vertical lines. And it's easily understood that this is some kind of uh, pattern which isn't part of the shape. It's also good to just add some more colors here to make this more subtle. So you don't want to use the strong colors from the outlines here, at least not everywhere, because otherwise the shape would be confusing. Just using some very... Um, it's like some small variants from the base colors to add details like this. Like up here and down here also just some random colors added to kind of like give it a bit of a marble view, uh, a marble feeling. That's the idea essentially. And uh, yes, so that's kind of like how you would uh, design a piece of furniture with without using any outlines or at least without starting with outlines. Essentially just using rough colors and later on using outlines to add details. Okay, uh, do we have any questions so far? Again? Um, yeah, we got questions about crosscode. <laughs> uh, do you ever plan to add an option to lock uh, the mouse within the game's border? Uh, there are no plans so far. I know there's an API, but it might be complicated. At least there's a lot of things we must consider when we implement this. Uh, maybe we will have a look at this, but it kind of also depends if this feature is actually supported by the browser we are using for the Windows version. This thing is kind of holding us back sometimes. Um, <laughs> yes, well, I know it's, yeah, the word, essentially this is dithering. Yes, I mean, it is dithering, I just wanted to describe dithering, that's kind of like what I wanted to do here. Uh, essentially, this is, this is some kind of dithering, even though it's uh, kind of more like some small diagonal shapes. Um, yeah, so... <laughs> Outline-free process, add some outlines. Yeah, well, outline-free process isn't really the right word, I admit. It's more like you don't start with outlines, you actually start with the color. But then again, yeah, you actually add the outlines pretty early in the end. But it's kind of like this idea that when you add the outlines, you add them with the right colors from the very beginning. So you don't just make everything black, but you actually already understand the shape and you use bright and dark outlines um, to kind of like uh, emphasize the three-dimensional shape. Okay. Um, yes, dithering TH is difficult. Okay. Perspective. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is... Um, Perspective, yeah, the perspective is uh, important, especially when you use, uh, if you create a top-down game. Um, the idea is, uh, like, if you have a side view game, like a side view shooter, it's a, a side view jump and run, something like this. It's not that much of an issue, you can just do things from the side, but if you have a top-down game, you kind of have to decide, uh, yeah, how do you want to, like, um, make the perception work with perspective. And um, now, when you have three-dimensional shapes, usually what you have is, uh, um, I think it's called shortening. Like when something is far away, it gets smaller, this kind of concept. 
it doesn't really work if you have 2D sprites, unless, um, at least not uh, when you create a top-down game. Um, it actually does work if you have a um, if you have a side view game because you can lose parallax scrolling and things in the background are in fact smaller. But if you have a top-down game where you can just go to whatever you see, like you can just walk up and down, you can just go to that tree, making it smaller is kind of problematic because if you would go there, your player had to become smaller. It's usually not feasible to do that. So everything has to kind of like stay the same size even if it's like uh, in the upper part of the screen or the lower part of the screen. So essentially there is things is not getting smaller if it's far away, if there's no shortening. Um, so um, the idea really is how do we still kind of work with the dev here. I mean one standard approach is, is to just don't use perspective transformation but orthogonal transformation which essentially means we don't use any shortening but essentially everything stays the same size but still um, like a surface which is um, the top surface might not be um, as might not have the same size on the screen like the front surface that is the, the kind of thing you might use here and very often that boils down of saying yeah okay if you have a top surface like from this box here the, the width is like the full size, however, the height is just half of the size. So it kind of like, you get this perception that there is some shortening there, even though if you would place the same box further upward, it would look exactly the same, which is kind of like this orthogonal projection. Um, so that's something you can do. In CrossCode, we actually did something else. In CrossCode, we said uh, there's actually no shortening. It's kind of, if you have a box, which is uh, a square on top, if you put it in the game, you actually still see the square. It's just as the width is just as large as the height for that surface. So this is actually not very intuitive because if you would see it like this, there's no reason why you would see the front surface because you would see it from t from the top. Um, we still do it, and it kind of works. It's kind of that's just showing that you don't have to be very realistic when it comes to perspective in 2D games. The only thing that is important is that you are consistent. So if you choose to use this kind of sh um, like style where you don't shorten things um, in the Y dimension essentially, then you have to, you should try to be consistent. Like if you use some kind of um, a barrel, if you want to just play some barrel in your scene, Essentially, you shouldn't draw it like this because here again you have a lot of shortening along the y dimension. Essentially, the y size is just half of the x size. Um, so this isn't really matching all that well. So you should make sure if you add some kind of bell kind of shape, some kind of cylinder, it should look like this. So essentially you have a cycle. It doesn't have to be a perfect cycle because what we very often do in Crossco is this kind of looks strange to just have this cycle and then kind of looks doesn't look like a barrel so what we do is something in between it's almost a cycle but the shortening is not very strong and that way it kind of matches and I think kind of like using consistency here kind of helps to uh, not break the illusion that this is just some kind of random graphics but it looks more consistent it's actually easy to understand for the player um, and just showing at the end like when it comes to 2D games um, it can just be it can be strange it doesn't have to make sense like um, I'm not even not sure if you knew but if you play uh, Electron Cell Link Between Words what looks like pretty normal here actually looks like this if you turn the angle it's actually not how you can see it in the game but somebody managed to create that screenshot using some a trick I think and yeah they essentially just skewed the whole 3d model to make this kind of perspective work because what the camera does is essentially just looking downward right at the surface so and if you would like use a regular 3D model, you wouldn't see any wall whatsoever, or at least it would be very short. And by just screwing everything that way, you actually do see the walls and uh, it kind of looks like the original from the Super Nintendo. So that's what happens if you try to recreate traditional 2D games with 3D graphics, you have to cheat like this. So it's just emphasizing that it doesn't have to be realistic, it just have to kind of be consistent. That's important. <laughs> All right. Um, yes, uh, that's um, that's all for the perspective. Next, I'm gonna talk about pixel bending and pillow shading, which are some two things that you should try to avoid when doing pixel art. 
Um, it's it's essentially it's uh, something that I also learned later on. At least the names I I learned later on. I just think it was maybe last year when I learned the word pixel banding. <laughs> um, so it is actually something that happens to a lot of pixel artists, even very good pixel artists. So it's like this kind of stuff might happen. And to some degree, I sometimes see people saying you should avoid it at all costs when essentially just you use an outline around your shape. And like you can argue that it's not that bad, but still, overall, you should try uh, to keep that in mind because sometimes really the, pic the sprite doesn't look good because of these effects. So. First, pixel binding. The idea is, if you have an outline and you want to make it kind of look smooth, sometimes something that people often do is just replicate the outline. Essentially, you just take a dark color, then you make a slightly lighter color, and make it again slightly lighter, and just repeat it like this. And what looks kind of okay close up kind of looks weird when you zoom out, actually. It is, um, it doesn't look, it looks really smooth and kind of like, uh, smooth in a bad way. It's, it's hard to describe, but anyway, it's something you should try to avoid, kind of like repeating pixels like this. What you should do instead is instead just use kind of trying to simulate anti-aliasing by just using those darker pixels at those points where you have uh, the steps of the line. Essentially there where you would have a diagonal, like here the line tries to be in between those two pixels, so you just add a slightly darker pixel here to kind of emphasize that the line is moving that way. And um, kind of like you can do this from one side, like here, or you can actually do this from both sides. And the line kind of looks more smooth that way, more straight and not kind of like blurry like it does on, on, on the left side. And um, finally, we have pillow shading, which I think is to some extent a variant of uh, pixel banding. Essentially, what you very often encounter is that people take a shape and then, then they want to apply some shading. So what do they do? They just make the center bright and the border dark, and then they just have a, some kind of smooth gradient from the center to the, out, to the outer edge. And that usually doesn't look good. Mostly because this isn't realistic. Usually you don't have shading where like the center is glowing and the da the the border is dark. Mostly you have light like, coming from a direction. So and using that direction is um is really important to make the shading look realistic. Um another problem with this here is that it has just too many colors. So essentially to fix this, the first thing is to just reduce colors. So instead of having I think these are about maybe eight to ten colors. Just use three, like here. Just reduce the colors first. Then make sure that the light is coming from a direction. Don't just make the bright surface in the center. Just put it to the upper left. Like so far, we have only used the upper left for the light sources. And then, when you have done this rough thing, what you can do is add additional colors again to kind of make this anti-aliasing effect. The idea is that you use the colors in an not like, don't use all the colors with about the same surface, but kind of certain colors take up most of the space of the shape. And then you just use some colors, very few pixels of those colors in between to kind of smoothen out the edges. And this kind of thing looks more like pixel art. It actually looks more like cell shading, which is usually something you want to achieve when you do pixel art, though to some degree it really depends on your style. But anyway, that's what you very often have in Pixar, kind of like this shade, shading style where you don't use a lot of colors, but you may add additional colors to kind of like uh, make the edges smooth. All right, and um, finally, some other example how pixel banding can look not so good. This is actually from a site called Purple Pony Studios. So they actually made also another nice tutorial about that topic and I just took the picture. So I just want to make sure I I create, give them credit. Essentially the idea is that um, on the left side here you have pillow shading slash pixel banding. Uh, you have a lot of colors here and as a result the thing kind of looks really like blurry. Uh, kind of um, like there was some gradient filter applied on it which doesn't really look like clean pixel art. And while on the left side you have a leaf which has very few colors but it kind of looks more pleasant. It looks more like proper pixel art because they use the colors really effectively. Kind of like there is a few colors here, 
to smoothen out the edges, but very few. It's not it's not pixel bending. It's proper aliase, anti-aliasing. And um, then they also add some more colors in between to kind of have an interesting um, pattern on top of the leaf. So that's kind of like a better example on how to use colors to create a leaf. Um, Yeah, it kind of looks like a balloon. That's a good way to describe it, essentially. Yeah, it could, looks like very like a very smooth surface. And there are actually some cases where pixel bending makes sense, but it's not. It doesn't happen very often. Like if something is glowing, like there is like really this kind of effect where the center is bright and the border is dark. In that case, it's kind of pillow shading, pixel bending makes sense. But most cases, it actually doesn't. So just be careful with that. If you shade stuff like this, it tends to not look that good. Okay, okay. Now that is, this is the final part of the presentation. Then it's done. I um, just want to talk about colors a bit. Uh, are there any questions in between? Doesn't look like it. So if you have any questions about uh, the presentation, just ask. Um, I'm always gonna answer at the end of each chapter. Anyway, let me just take a drink. A lot of talking. Anyway, colors. The thing is, the truth is, I used to hate colors. Um, that's also one reason why I actually worked on a game which was black and white. I mean, actually, that was a contest. But I actually noticed that I really enjoyed working on that game because you didn't have to care about colors. You just had your four colors. There wasn't much you could do wrong that way. Uh, it was really pleasant to work on that, I have to admit. And it's also something great to kind of like learn how to do basic shading where you don't have to care about colors. So doing stuff black and white is actually a nice exercise to just see if you can make shading work without relying on colors too much. Uh, but anyway, most games these days are in, have colors for a good reason. So fortunately I got over it and there have been a few tricks that really helped me to deal with colors in a better way. Um, the first thing is how to create good color ramps. And the secret here is to use something called U-shifting. This is something where you make sure if you create the shades of a color, you do not simply take the shade and make it darker. So you don't mix it with black to create shadows and you don't, uh, not, don't just add white to make the brighter versions. What you do instead is kind of shift the color when you make darker variants. Here, for instance, we have a yellow that moves to a slight red uh, for, the shell, for the darker colors. And uh, this kind of, in most cases, really looks more pleasant. It's kind of, it is actually somewhat related to reality because if you are, um, if you go outside and you have a blue sky, if you look at shadows, they actually tend to be blue because of the blue sky, which is kind of like the blue light of the sky is scattering around. That is why this is why shadows tend to be more blue. And um, That's not kind a of good excuse for Felix to use blue and everything. Yes, yes, it is. <laughs> blue is awesome. Blue is everywhere. Anyway, so <laughs> this is kind of uh, like there is some extent to some extent there's real realism there. Um, you don't have to do it the real way. You can actually experiment with what kind of colors you want to shift to. Sometimes I just do weird stuff where actually the shadows are purple, which doesn't make sense, but sometimes it actually looks pretty cool. So it, just feel free to experiment. But um, yeah, using U shifting really can improve the impression of the image. Just to give an example, now this is a scene from CrossCode, as you probably should know it. Um, there's a lot of U shifting here. Like uh, for instance, um, the trees, they move from a yellow over to a red up to a blue. There's actually a blue color in these trees. Uh, the same here for the Cree. And this, like, you have like a more yellowish green, which goes to a more like a bluish green up to a blue in the shadow. And even if you zoom, actually, I think I can click here. Even if you look very closely in the cliffs, there's also some blue hidden there. There's just blue everywhere. Like the shadows are actually blue. There's, they're not just a, a dark brown. There's actually a very dark blue in there. Um, yeah, so that is how it looks in CrossCode. And here's an example how it looks when you don't do this. So this image doesn't use any U shifting. And you might notice that it looks really different. It's kind of, it looks kind of sad. It kind of looks monotonous. There's like, it looks like you're looking at some kind of very old picture, which had kind of lost its uh, 
uh, the, the vibrant colors or something like this. So this is how it looks like if you don't use any U-shifting whatsoever. And again, this is not saying that you have to use U-shifting because sometimes you actually might want to achieve this. So if you want to create this kind of feeling, sometimes it's actually good to not use U-shifting. But uh, in most cases, uh, in many cases at least, it makes sense to at least try using U-shifting uh, to make colors look more interesting, more vibrant, things like this. Uh, yeah, so another thing about colors, especially since we are talking about pixel art, less is more sometimes. This is actually kind of related to the whole pixel bending stuff I had before. Um, when you add too many uh, colors, sometimes it looks worse. So just reducing colors is sometimes helping. Here we actually have an interesting um, experiment. What I did is I just took a, a bovine enemy and tried to add more colors. If you look closely, you can see actually there's a lot more colors here in between everywhere. And actually, when I showed this to people, some said, hey, this actually looks pretty cool. And yeah, I mean, you cannot decide this is kind of like a matter of taste. Some people might actually like this kind of um, graphic style where you have a lot of colors. It actually looks more like uh, a 3D rendering, which is just pre-rendered 2 d to the two, uh, two dimensional image, in, if you ask me. On the left side, this looks more like proper pixel art, I think, because pixel art is kind of defined by using few colors. It's hard to argue this is really better, but it looks more like proper pixel art, if you ask me. Now, what is important? If you use these kind of images, you have to make sure that it is consistent. And if you just place this kind of bovine enemy in crosscode, you end up with this. And if you ask me, this really doesn't fit in. And this is actually something that you need to consider if you want to create very consistent graphics. You have to kind of make sure either you use a lot of colors for everything or you don't use a lot of colors, like you use very few colors for everything. If you just put like a very, this bovine with a lot of colors in crosscode, it kind of sticks out because everything has very few colors, looks very traditional pixel art stylish, while this one looks really smooth all of a sudden, kind of like it doesn't fit in there. Yeah, so, yeah, anyway, so that is, um, that is kind of like um, the thing about colors. And now the last thing is, I just want to give you a small demonstration, um, like a very good way to deal with colors is, to f is kind of to adapt things during the whole progress. So when you design a new tile set, what you should do is try to be careful with colors. Make sure that you use colors very consistently among different parts of the tile set. Also make sure they don't overlap. So make sure that the grass only use different colors, for instance, than the plants that you put on top of the grass. And if you do that, what you can do is using certain tools in the image editing program to change colors very easily. Uh, unfortunately, I can only show you how to do this in Photoshop because I don't have a lot of experience with other tools. Though I'm sure there's uh, ways to do that with other programs as well. I just noticed that I did something here and it's not correct, so that's good. So let's just make it better now. So what I did here is essentially, this is the tile set of the jungle for crosscode. So you see there's a lot of tiles. And on the right, I just put a screenshot right from the game. Um, we actually have some kind of uh, method to take a screenshot disabling all the effects. So here we actually have the actual colors from the tile set. They're not modified in any way. So that means if both of these things are on the same layer, what I can do is just use the magic uh, wand tool. That's a, what, the magic wand tool. And just select, in, uh, select individual colors from the grass like this. And the first thing you notice, there's not a lot of colors, and that's why it's easy to actually select uh, the whole grass. The whole grass actually maybe has four or five colors. Uh, if you look at other tiles like these here, there's a few more. So just with a few clicks, I can essentially just select everything that is grass in the tile set. So like this grass is selected, this here, and also in the screenshot. Once you have done this, you can create something which is called a gradient map. And the gradient map is an awesome tool. It's really one of the best tools ever to find the best colors because it really helps you um, to assign a whole color ramp to something, not just set colors individually, but specify the whole color ramp in one go. And especially in Photoshop, it's implemented in a very nice way because it gives you a very quick preview 
uh, of your colors and that is really helpful to find a good color ramp. So essentially what I did here is just, okay, if I just make it like this, the grass suddenly is just black and white. So that's pretty boring. So we just go in here. Uh, what you can do is actually just disable the effect, edit the gradient and just pick colors that you used before and just arrange them here somehow. That kind of helps to find a color ramp which is somewhat similar to what you had before. And um, Okay, so now I have just some colors selected. I enable it again and now what you do is just move the sliders a bit like this and probably zoom in a bit more. Now that's actually way too bright. So essentially just move this over here a bit. There's always everything way too much to the to the left. More to the right and you have something like this. Let me let me, then you can always enable this ABD effect to see difference. So now we actually have something that is very close. Actually something I might even consider changing in the jungle tile set. I think the grass is a bit too saturated. It's a bit there's too colorful. It's kind of sometimes on certain display it kind of like it's a bit hard to look at. So what actually something I was looking thinking about is making it a bit less saturated, like more grayish, like a very little bit more grayish. Kind of like this. Uh, I'm not really sure that's a good color, but anyway, so here you have a very quick preview on how the two versions look. I mean, especially if you look at this part, this kind of looks a bit hard to look at. So you have this gray colors and then suddenly there's this very saturated green in between. And this variant is actually much more pleasant to look at, I think. It's kind of like feels um, like a better match, but overall it's maybe a bit too crazy if I think about it. So you can make this one a little bit more greenish. But anyway, so you can just go on like this and tweak the gradient map and it's a very effective tool to adapt the colors of whatever you're creating. So at least to me that was one of the most important discoveries during the development of CrossCode that really helped me to um, to tweak colors of all kind of things in CrossCode. So yeah, that's why I'm showing it to you and I hope you like this technique too and you might be able to use this for your own game if you want to create one. So, um, this essentially concludes the demo and also the presentation. So thanks everybody for listening. Um, I hope you found at least something interesting here. And uh, if you like this, please like and subscribe the video if you see it on YouTube. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, um, if you're interested, we can do this maybe sometime else. Maybe more about technical things in CrossCode. Uh, because it's it's possible that I uh, will do another presentation soon about CrossCode and then I might be able to show this here on the stream as well if you guys are interested. So, um, yeah, this essentially concludes the presentation. So, thank you.